What ho? We're here. This is the final instalment of our read-along for Terry Pratchett's Guards Guards. I, I'm not even sad, actually. I've loved reading this to you. Reading it again was like reading it for the first time for me. And to react alongside you guys, some of you who are seasoned pros with the old Discworld multiverse universe, some of you who had never read it before and had never really encountered anything other than Tiffany before. So, um, yeah, it's been a treat. And we will definitely read Men at Arms, which is the next City Watch book. Even better than this one, I think. And actually, funnily enough, I started in the middle. That was the first ever Discworld book I read, Men at Arms. I read it one holiday whilst I was staying in Turkey. There you go. True story, that. True story. <laughs> and then I started all over again. But anyway, here we go. Let's start the final part. Um, I think we're going for about 20 pages tonight, so we'll be here for a while, but it's okay. It's the final episode. For me, it's about 5 to 8 p.m., so I know the boys need to get to bed soon, so I need to go and get them all <laughs> sorted. So I won't take too long, but we'll get it finished. <coughs> Sit back. Here they come. It was the next day. The room was wall to wall with civic dignitaries. The patrician sat on his severe chair, surrounded by the council. Everyone present was wearing the shiny waxen grins of those bent on good works. Lady Sybil Ramkin sat off to one side, wearing a few acres <laughs> of black velvet. The Ramkin family jewels glittered on her fingers, neck and in the black curls of today's wig. The total effect was striking, like a globe of the heavens. Vimes marched the rank to the centre of the hall and stamped to a halt with his helmet under his arm as per regulations. He'd been amazed to see that even Nobby had made an effort. The suspicion of shiny metal could be seen here and there on his breastplate. And Colon was wearing an expression of almost constipated importance. Carrot's armour gleamed. Colon ripped off a textbook salute for the first time in his life. All present and correct, sir, he barked. Very good, Sergeant, said Vimes, coldly. He turned to the patrician and raised an eyebrow politely. Lord Vetinari gave her what little wave of his hand. Stand easy, or, or whatever it is you chaps do, he said. I'm sure we needn't wait on ceremony here. What do you say, Captain? Just as you like it, sir, said Vimes. Now, men, said the patrician, leaning forward. We have heard some remarkable accounts of your magnificent efforts in the defence of the city. Vimes let his mind wander as the golden platitudes floated past. For a while, he derived a certain amount of amusement from watching the faces of the council. A whole sequence of expressions drifted across, across them as the patrician spoke. It was, of course, vitally important that there be a ceremony like this. Then the whole thing could be neat and settled and forgotten. Just another chapter in the long and exciting history of etc, etc. Ankh-Morpork Pork was good at starting new chapters. His trawling gaze fell on Lady Ramkin. She winked. Vime's eyes swivelled front again, <laughs> his expression suddenly as wooden as a plank. I've never had a woman wink at me, but I imagine <laughs> that that is how I would react. <laughs> Token of our gratitude, the patrician finished, sitting back. Vimes realised that everyone was looking at him. Pardon? He said. I said, we have been trying to think of some suitable recompense, Captain Vimes. Various public sit spirited citizens, the patrician's eyes took in the council and Lady Ramkin, and, of course, myself, feel that an appropriate reward is due. <laughs> Vimes looked blank. Reward? It is customary for such heroic endeavour, said the patrician, a little testily. Vimes faced forward again. Really haven't thought about it, sir. Can't speak for the men, of course. There was an awkward pause. Out of the corner of his eye, Vimes was aware of Nobby nudging the sergeant in the ribs. Eventually, Colon stumbled forward and ripped off another salute. Permission to speak, sir, he muttered. The patrician nodded graciously. The sergeant coughed and removed his helmet and <laughs> pulled out a scrap of paper. I'm guessing the men have thought of it. Uh, 
the thing is, saving your honour's presence, we think, you know, what with saving the city and everything, or sort of, or what I mean is, we we just had a go, you see, man on the spot and that sort of thing. Uh, the thing is, we reckon we're entitled. If if you catch my drift, the assembled company company nodded. This was exactly how it should be. Do go on, said the patrician. So we like put our heads together, said the sergeant. A bit of a cheek, I know. Please carry. On, Sergeant, said the patrician. You needn't keep stopping. We are well aware of the magnitude of the matter. Right, sir. Well, sir. First, it's the wages. The wages, said Lord Vitanari. He stared at Vimes. He stared at nothing. The sergeant raised his head. His expression was the determined expression of a man who was going to see it through. <laughs> yes, sir. Thirty dollars a month. It's not right. We think... He licked his lips and glanced behind him at the other two who were making vague, encouraging motions. <laughs> I can picture it. We think a basic rate of um, $35 a month. He stared at the patrician's stony expression. With increments as per rank, we thought $5. He licked his lips again, unnerved by the patrician's expression. We won't go below four, he said. And that's flat. Sorry, Your Highness, but there it is. The patrician glanced again at Vime's impassive face, then looked back at the rank. That's it, he said. Nobby whispered in Colon's air and then darted back. The sweating sergeant gripped his helmet as though it was the only real thing in the world. There, there, there was another thing, your reverence, he said. Ah, the patrician smiled knowingly. There's the kettle. It wasn't much good anyway, and then Errol ate it. It was nearly two dollars. We could do with a new kettle, if, it, if it's all the same, your lordship. The patrician leaned forward, gripping the arms of his chair. I want to be clear about this, he said coldly. Are we to believe that you are asking for a petty wage increase and a domestic utensil? <laughs> I couldn't read it without laughing. Carrot whispered in Colon's other ear. <laughs> Colon turned two bulging, watery rimmed eyes to the dignitaries. The rim of his helmet was passing through his fingers like a mill wheel. Well, he began, sometimes we thought, you know, when we has our dinner break, or when it's quiet, like at the end of a watch, as it may be, and we want to relax, you know, wind down, his voice trailed away. Yes, Colon took a deep breath. I suppose a dartboard would be out of the question. The thunderous silence that followed was broken by an erratic snorting. <laughs> Vime's helmet dropped out of his shaking hand. His breastplate wobbled as the suppressed laughter of the years burst out in great uncontrollable eruptions. He turned his face to the row of councillors and laughed and laughed until the tears came. Laughed at the way they got up, all confusion and outraged dignity. Laughed at the patrician's carefully immobile expression. Laughed for the world and the saving of souls. Laughed and laughed and laughed until the tears came. Nobby craned up to reach Colon's ear. I told you, he hissed. I said they'd never wear it. I knew a dark boy would be pushing our luck. You've upset them all now. <laughs> I love that bit. Anyway, it, that really does, hey, Mickey, sum up <laughs> the watch. <laughs> love them, love them. Dear mother and father, wrote Carrot, you will never guess I have been in the watch only a few weeks and already I am to be made a full constable. Captain Vime said the patrician himself said I was to be one and that he also hoped I would have a long and successful career in the watch as well and he would follow it with special interest. Also, my wages are to go up by $10 and we had a special bonus of $20 that Captain Vimes paid out of his own pocket. Sergeant Colon said that. Please find the money enclosed. I'm keeping a little bit by though because I, want to see, I went to see Reet and Mrs Palm. She said all the girls had been following my career with great interest as well and I am to come to dinner on my night off. Sergeant Colon has been telling me about how to start courting, which is very interesting and not at all complicated, it appears. I arrested a dragon.
but it got away. I hope Mr. Vaneshi is well. I'm happy as anyone can be in the whole wide world. Your son, Carrot. <laughs> I love Carrot. Uh, Pratchett's characters. Anyway. Vimes knocked on a door. An effort, uh, here we go. An effort had been made to spruce up the Rampkin mansion, he noticed. The encroaching shrubbery had been pitilessly hacked back. An elderly workman atop a ladder was nailing the stucco back on the walls while another, with a spade, was rather arbitrarily defining the line where the lawn ended and the old flower beds had begun. Vimes stuck his helmet under his arm, smoothed back his hair and knocked. He considered asking Sergeant Colon to accompany him, but had brushed the idea aside quickly. He couldn't have tolerated the sniggering. Anyway, what was there to be afraid of? He had stared into the jaws of death three times. Four, if you included telling Lord Veterinary to shut up. To his amazement, the door was eventually opened by a butler so elderly that he might have been resurrected by the knocking. Yes, he said. Captain Vimes, City Watch, said Vimes. The man looked him up and down. Oh, yes, he said. Her ladyship did say. I believe her ladyship is with her dragons, he said. If you like to wait in here, I will... I know the way, said Vimes, and he set off around the overgrown path. The kennels were a ruin. An assortment of battered wooden boxes were lying around under an oilcloth awning. From their depths, a few sad swamp dragons whiffled a greeting at him. A couple of women were moving purposefully among the boxes, ladies, rather. They were far too untidy to be mere women. No ordinary women would have dreamed of looking so scruffy. You needed the complete self-confidence that comes with knowing who your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather was before you could wear clothes like that. But they were, Fimes noticed, incredibly good clothes. Or had been once, clothes bought by one's parents, but so expensive and of such good quality that they never wore out and were handed down, like old china and silverware and gout. Dragon breeders, he thought. You can tell. There's something about them. It's the way they wear their silk scarves, old tweed coats and grandad's riding boots. And the smell, of course. A small, wiry woman with a face like old saddle leather caught sight of him. Ah, oh, you'll be the gallant captain. She tucked an errant strand of white hair back under a headscarf and extended a veiny brown hand. Brent Rodley, that's Rosie de Vontmolay. She runs the Sunshine Sanctuary, you know. The other woman, who had the build of someone who could pick up cart horses in one hand and shoe them with the other, gave him a friendly grin. Samuel Vimes, said Vimes weakly. My father was a Sam, said Brenda vaguely. You can always trust a Sam, he said. She shooed a dragon back into its box. We're just helping Sybil. Old friends, you know. Collections all to blazes, of course. They were all over the city, the little devils. I dare say they'll come back when they're hungry, though. What a bloodline, eh? Sorry? Sybil reckons he was a sport, but I say we should be able to breed back into the line in three or four generations. I'm famed for my stud, you know, she said. That'd be something, though. A whole new type of dragon. Vimes thought of supersonic contrails crisscrossing the sky. He said, yeah. Well, we must get on. Uh, is, isn't Lady Rampkin around? said Vimes. I got this message that it was essential, she said, for me to come here. She's indoors somewhere, said Miss Wardley. She said she had something important to see to. Oh, do be careful with that one, Rose, you silly girl. More important than dragons, said Vimes. Yes, can't think what's come over here. Brenda Rodley fished in the pocket of an oversized waistcoat. Nice to have met you, Captain. Always good to meet new members of the fancy. Do drop in any time you're passing. I'd only be too happy to show you around. She extracted a grubby card and pressed it into his hand. Must be off now. We've heard that some of them are trying to build nests on the university tower. Can't have that. Must get them down before it gets dark. Vimes squinted at the card as the two women crushed off down the drive carrying nets and ropes. It said... Brenda, Lady Rodley, the Dower House, Querm Castle, Querm. What it meant, he realised, was that striding away down the path like an animated rummage stall was the Dowager Duchess of Querm, who owned more country than you could ever see from a very high mountain on a very clear day. Nobby would not have approved. There seemed to be a special kind of poverty that only the very, very rich could possibly afford. That was how you got to be power in the land, he thought. 
You never cared a toss about whatever anyone else thought, and you were never, ever uncertain about anything. He padded back to the house. A door was open. It led into a large but dark and musty hall. Up in the gloom, the heads of dead animals haunted the walls. The rampkins seemed to have endangered more species than the Ice Age. Vimes wandered aimlessly through another mahogany archway. It was a dining room containing a kind of table where the people at the other end are in a different time zone. One end had been colonised by silver candlesticks. It was laid for two. A battery of cutlery flanked each plate. Antique wine glasses sparkled in the candlelight. A terrible premonition took hold of Vimes at the same moment as a gust of captivation. The most expensive perfume available anywhere in Ankh-Morpork blew past of him. Ah, oh, Captain, so nice of you to come. Vimes turned around slowly without his feet appearing to move. Lady Ramkin stood there magnificently. Vimes was vaguely aware of a brilliant blue dress that sparkled in the candlelight, a mass of hair the colour of chestnuts, a slightly anxious face that suggested that a whole battalion of skilled painters and decorators had only just dismantled their scaffolding and gone home, and a faint creaking that said underneath it all mere corsetry was being subjected to the kind of tensions more usually found in the heart of large stars. I, um, he said, if you, um, if you'd said, um, I, uh, I'd dress more suitable, uh, extremely, um, very, uh, she bore down upon him like a glittering siege engine. <laughs> that's, that's a simile and a half. In a sort of dream, he allowed himself to be ushered to a seat. He must have eaten because servants appeared out of nowhere with things stuffed with other things and came back later and took the plates away. The butler reanimated occasionally to fill glass after glass with strange wines. The heat from the candles was enough to cook by, and all the time Lady Ramkin talked in a bright and brittle way about the size of the house, the responsibilities of a huge estate, the feeling that it was more it was time to take one's position in society more seriously, while the setting sun filled the room with red and Vime's head began to spin. Ooh, society, he managed to think. Didn't know what was going to hit it. Dragons weren't mentioned once. Although, after a while, something under the table put its head on Vimes' knee and dribbled. Vimes found it impossible to contribute to the conversation. He felt outflanked, beleaguered. He made one sally, hoping maybe to reach high ground from which to flee into exile. Where do you think they've gone? He said. Where what? Said Lady Ramkin, temporarily halted. The dragons. You know, Errol and his... W female. Oh, somewhere isolated and rocky. I should imagine, anyway. Favourite country for dragons. But it, she's a magical animal. What'll happen when the magic goes away? Lady Ramkin gave him a shy smile. Most people seem to manage, she said. She reached across the table and touched his hand. Oh, saucy. Your men think you need looking after, she said meekly. Oh, do they, said Vimes. Sergeant Colon said he thought we'd get along like a maison en flambe. Oh, did he? And he said something else, she said. What was it now? Oh, yes, it's a million to one chance, said Lady Ramkin. I think, he then said, but it might just work. She smiled at him, and then it arose and struck Vimes that in her own special category, she was quite beautiful. This was the category of all the women in his entire life who had ever thought he was worth smiling at. She couldn't do worse, but then he couldn't do it any better. So maybe it balanced out. She wasn't getting any younger, but then who was? And she had style and money and common sense and self-assurance and all the things that he didn't. And she had opened her heart. And if you he let her, she could engulf you. The woman was a city. And eventually, under siege, you did what Ankh Morpork had always done. Unbar the gates, let the conquerors in, and make them your own. How did you start? She seemed to be expecting something. He shrugged and picked up his wine glass and sought for a phrase. One crept into his wildly resonating mind. Here's looking at you, kid, he said. The gongs of various midnights banged out the old day. 
and further towards the hub where the Ramtok Mountains joined the forbidden spires of the Central Massif, where strange hairy creatures roamed the eternal snows, where blizzards howled around the freezing peaks, the lights of a lone lamassery shone out over the high valleys. In the courtyard, a couple of yellow-robed monks stapped the last case of small green bottles onto a sleigh, ready for the first leg of the incredible difficult journey down to the distant plains. The box was labelled in careful brushstrokes, Master C.M.O.T. Dibbler, Ankh-Morpork. You know, Lobsang, said one of them, one cannot help wondering what it is he does with this stuff. Corporal Nobbs and Sergeant Colin lounged in the shadows near the melted drum, mended drum, not melted drum, but straightened up as Carrot came out bearing a tray. Detritus the troll stepped aside respectfully. Here we are, lads, said Carrot. Three pints on the house. Ooh, blimey. I never thought you'd do it, said Colon, grasping the handle. What'd you say to him? I just explained how it was the duty of all good citizens to help the guards at all times, said Carrot innocently, and I thanked him for his cooperation. Yeah, and the rest, said Nobby. No, that was all I said. Well, then, you must have a really convincing tone of voice. Ah, uh, well... Make the most of it, lads, while it lasts, said Colon. They drank thoughtfully. It was a moment of supreme peace, a few minutes snatched from the realities of real life. It was a brief bite of stolen fruit and enjoyed as such. No one in the whole city seemed to be fighting or stabbing or making a fray, and just for now it was possible to believe that this wonderful state of affairs, affairs might continue. And even if it didn't, then there were memories to get them through, of running and people getting out of the way, of the looks on the faces of the horrible palace guard, of when all the thieves and heroes and gods had failed, of being there, of nearly doing things nearly right. Robbie shoved... Robbie? Well, we take that now. Nobby shoved the pot of a, on a convenient windowsill, stamped some life back into his feet and blew on his fingers. A brief fumble in the dark recesses of his ear produced a fragment of cigarette. What a time, eh? said Colon contentedly as the flare of a match illuminated the three of them. The others nodded. Yesterday seemed like a lifetime ago, even now. But you could never forget something like that, no matter who else did, no matter what happened from now on. If I never see any blooming king, it will be too soon, said Nobby. I don't reckon he was the right king anyway, said Carrot. Talking of kings, anyone want a crisp? There's no right kings, said Colon, but without much rancor. Ten dollars a month was going to make a big difference. Mrs. Colon was acting very differently towards a man bringing home another ten dollars a month. Her notes on the kitchen table were a lot more friendly. No, but, I mean, there's nothing special about having an ancient sword, said Carol, or a birthmark. I mean, look at me. I've got a birthmark on my arm. My brother's got one too, said Colin, shaped like a boat. Mine's more like a crown thing, said Carrot. Oh, that makes you a king then, grinned, grinned Nobby. <laughs> Stands to reason. I don't see why. My brother's not an admiral, said Colin reasonably. And I got this sword, said Carrot. He drew it. Colon took it from his hand and turned it over and over in the light from the flare over the drum's door. The blade was dull and short and notched like a saw. It was well made and there might have been an inscription on it once, but it had long ago been worn into indecipherability by sheer use. It was a nice sword, he said thoughtfully. Well balanced. But not one for a king, said Carrot. King's swords are big and shiny and magical and they have jewels on and when you hold them up they catch the light. Ting! Ting, said Colon. Yeah, I suppose they have to, really. I'm just saying, you can't go round giving people thrones just because of stuff like that, said Carrot. That's what Captain Vime said. Nice job, mind, said Nobby. Good hours, Keen. Hmm? Colon had momentarily been lost in a little world of speculations. Real kings had shiny swords, obviously. Except, except, except maybe a real king of, like, days of yore, he would have had a sword that didn't sparkle one bit, but was blooming efficient at cutting things. Just a thought. I said, kinging is a good job, Nobby repeated. Short hours. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. N not long days, said Colon. He gave Kara a thoughtful look. Ah, uh, there's that, of course. Anyway, my father says being king's too much like hard work. All the surveying and assaying and everything. He drained his pint. It's not the kind of thing for the likes of us. Us, he looked proudly. Guards. You're right, Sergeant. Mm, what? Oh, yeah, Colon shrugged. What about it anyway? Maybe things turned out for the best. He finished the beer. Best be off, he said. What time was it? About twelve o'clock, said Carrot. Anything else? Carrot gave it some thought. And all's well, he said. Right, just testing. You know, said Nobby, the way you say it, lad, you could almost believe that it was true. Let the eye of the attention pull back. This is the disc. World and mirror of worlds, born through space on the back of four giant elephants who stand on the back of Great Atuin, the Sky Turtle. Around the rim of this world, the ocean pours off endlessly into the night. As its hub rises, the ten-mile spike of the Cori Celesti, on whose glittering summit the gods play games with the fates of men. If you know what the rules are, and who are the players. On the far edge of the disc, the sun was rising. The light of the morning began to flow across the patchwork of seas and continents, but it did so slowly because light is tardy and slightly heavy in the presence of a magical field. On the dark crescent, where the old light of sunset had barely drained from the deepest valleys, two specks, one big, one small, flew out of the shadow, skimmed low across the swells of the rim ocean and struck out determinedly over the totally unfathomable star-dotted depths of space. Perhaps the magic would last. Perhaps it wouldn't. But then, what does? Did it? I loved reading that book. Cool. I hope you really enjoyed it. Like I said, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it to you. And we will, I told you, be reading uh, Men at Arms in the future. All right, I'm, it's not a Pratchett fanboy channel, so I'm not going to do three Pratchett, Pratchett's in a row. But that leads me nicely on to our comments. So I saw, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? So wait, here he is, Gorilla's Random Thoughts. Can we get Sir Thursday next? Sir Thursday is coming up. It's, it's not next, but I think it's next, next, Gorilla's Random Thoughts. Because tomorrow... We start one that I kind of wanted to start a, a little while ago. Some of you will be happy. Some of you won't. But I can't please all of you. Tomorrow, we're going to start another DWJ. Another book in the Crestomancy series. Which week? Going to start that one tomorrow. Different style in it to Pratchett. And like I said, we've, we've kind of been drowned in Pratchett just recently, haven't we? So it'll be weird to have... Weird. It'll taste different having um the different style of dwj going on but yeah starting tomorrow our next read along is witch week when the note written in ordinary ballpoint turns up in the homework books mr crossley is marking he's very upset for this is larwood house a school for witch orphans where witchcraft is utterly forbidden and yet magic keeps breaking out all over the place like measles the last thing they need is a visit from the Divisional Inquisitor. If only Crestomancy could come and sort out all the trouble. <laughs> I'm sure he will. There you go. So um, I'm going to reply to Gorilla's Random Thoughts here. Uh, that is next, next. Tomorrow we start DWJ. There you go, Gorilla's Random Thoughts. He's... He, I think it's he, is now getting that in his pocket. He'll wonder what that was. That was me. Hello. Anyway, let's scroll down to the bottom. We've got a love heart here from Time Traveller. You may have a love heart back, Time Traveller. Uh, here's Mary Bull. Um, I, we got a bit philosophic last night, didn't we, Mary? When we were talking about, like, is there a right leg to go down? Or not I mean, as in left leg, but a correct leg to go down in the, um, in the pants of decision i can't remember what it was called pants of time no, I, don't know. I don't know but in the trouser legs you know when you're making a fork in the road you'd I, I said i think i can't really remember like you'd 
don't know which is the right decision. You don't go down that one and then think, oh, I should have gone down there. Do you? I don't know. But she said, and I was a lot more um, eloquent with how I said that last night, I think. <laughs> Mary said, I think we make a choice and then we make it the right one. Yeah, I agree there, Mary. Love half of you. He's commented here. Time travellers reply to that. Yes, Mary, it has to be, doesn't it? We don't often go around thinking, today I'll make the bad choice. We have to make our choices good. Hmm. So for some people, I suppose. I suppose other people, like, and there are people out there in the world who want to make the bad choice for the bad reasons. But none of them are here, are they? Here's Mickey. Seeing the beginning little seed of Vimes and Vetinari's balance and act in the later books. Of course, Vetinari is always going to see the large mass of evil. Given his clockmaker's perspective over the city, he relies upon it. But Vimes was a gutter kid from the poorest part of the poorest part of the city. Not a spoiler, he did mention his, but it's just a nice counterpoint coming from the man that first appeared in this book drunkenly singing in a rainy gutter because he'd just had to bury one of the few remaining members of the Night Watch. Why do you get up in the morning indeed? Uh, Neve Graham. I haven't ever heard from Neve Graham before. Uh, Neve Graham is on currently on Chapter 2, but she commented, I always look forward to these. It's such a comfort listening to you read. Oh, thanks. You've been here a while. Like I said, I, never, I don't think I've ever heard from you before, Neve Graham. I was just thinking as I was listening how hard it must be to keep track of the voices. <laughs> but you made it seem effortless and keep the momentum of the story. Oh, thanks. It... I, ne I never, even in a job interview, blow my own trumpet, but it is blooming hard work sometimes, and sometimes I do get it faffed up, don't I? But um, we always get there. Nix Hicks has given me a full stop. Why are you giving me a full stop, Nix Hicks? I can't remember what we were talking about. Was it my jacket potato last night because it was Monday? Mm. Uh, here's Time Traveller. Dear all... As is the way, story first, comments afterwards. This is my comment afterwards. <laughs> I've enjoyed meeting you all here in the interactive hyperspace of 21st century technology, combining with a past century of TP before he was sir, before he was dead, for presumed missing. Before there was YouTube, there was only the interiority of my own head in which to enjoy books. Why is this interactive style not more popular? Interactive audio books, Mr. S. Styley. It's like Infinity, the next big thing. Till we meet again, yours. Still on the move, Victoria. <laughs> you funny thing you are. Uh, here's Terry. I love how this book sets up the rest of the guards' books. It gave us enough interest in each of the characters to make an emotional connection. Somehow Terry makes every character seem important, even just the castle guards. That's right. And uh, so we said before, didn't we? We love them witches. Og, Weatherwax, and Garlic. There they are, the three. And Aiken, I suppose, as well. But Vimes, particularly Lily. Vimes. Love her there. Um, but the whole gang of the City Watch. But Vimes will become... I guarantee, if, if you let me read you the entire City Watch series, which I'm happy to do, even if I'm sitting here with a long, grey, wizened beard and... Uh, 100 years old. You will love Vimes. I know it all the way through. He is a constant. Vimes all the way. Uh, but yeah, I agree, Terry. And here she is again. You're lucky you've only met a few weirdos. Yeah, I said that last night, didn't I? <laughs> In my time here, um, there's been a few weirdos. And they're horrible. <laughs> but um, yeah, lucky I've only met a few. Someone from um, Someone from work said to me the other day, or like this morning actually, am I one of the weirdos? Well, I didn't name any names, did I? But I know you're listening. <laughs> no, you're not really. You're not really. Um, oh, and then someone has literally just commented, but on one of the David Williams story things. The boy in the dress. I guess that means they want me to read the boy in the dress. Yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. 35 minutes left. But yeah, thanks for sticking around. That's the end of this playlist. I really hope that you stick around to go into the next playlist because I noticed whilst I've done my last two Pratchett books we've got a few more people watching not all of you are subscribed I'd love it if you were 
but you don't have to be. But I can see on my um, on my numbers that I've got a few more people watching since we started doing Pratchett. So I'm hoping that you don't all go, DWJ, or anything to do with her. No, stick around, stick around. I promise it will be good. We'll make it good. All right. Uh, right. That's that then. So I'll see you all tomorrow for a new playlist. I've got to make a new thumbnail. Oh my goodness. I'll give me something to do tonight after I put the boys in bed. It's now half past eight. <laughs>